didn't want to get some technology set up here. My name is Lisa Pulliam, and I'm author of Meet the New You, a 21-day plan for embracing fresh attitudes and focused habits for real life change. And today, we're going to get a chance to chat about uh, what real life change looks like and opportunity for me to tell you about this book. So what you don't see is that I have lots of help behind the screen here. My publisher is at Waterbrook Press, is actually hosting this webcast. And Amy, my um, marketing guru, is operating the chat room there for you. So she uh, will be answering your questions. Um, if you have technical issues, you can, you can just chat, put it right in that chat box. And you can ask questions of me that I will answer. So I'm so bummed, I don't actually get to hear your voice. Um, you only get to hear mine, but I'm hoping that whatever your questions are, are going to come to me. You're going to see me kind of glance this way because I have an iPad set up here and Amy is going to speak back to me. She's going to type in um, any of the content and the questions that you have for me. So I'm just really, really glad that you're here. I don't know what you're doing in the middle of the afternoon. We have a really beautiful day here in Pennsylvania. I'm thankful that it's not as cold as yesterday. Uh, and I'm thankful that this was not yesterday because I had no heat in my house yesterday that was being worked on. Um, and I am so glad for technology that we can all be together. I wish I knew who was there, so maybe Amy will be able to let me know at various points. Now, before we get started, here's a really important piece of information. You have a chance of winning a copy of Meet the New You. So if you already have a copy and you win a copy, you can give away a copy and you know you don't want to give anybody your copy because you're going to be writing in it. And so uh, the way you get to win a book is by asking a question. And then every 10 minutes, uh, Amy's going to pick winners for us. So I just want to make sure that this process over here is working um, and that the screen is loading up. Okay, so let me, let me first start off with prayer, if you don't mind. I want to pray for this time together, and I want to pray for you um, before we even get going. Lord Jesus, I thank you for technology. I cannot believe I get to sit in the middle of my living room and serve you this way and that uh, you'll be able to speak a word of encouragement to women and maybe men even around this country, maybe around this world who are going to listen to this uh, webcast. Lord, I ask that you would speak hope into their hearts, that you would reveal vision and direction and contentment and joy. God, I pray that they would... Um, experience fellowship with you as they hang out and listen to whatever you put on my my lips, Lord. I pray that my words would be yours and that we would glorify you uh, together in this uh, virtual community opportunity right now. Thank you for the privilege of writing this book and speaking your truth. And I give this all to you in Jesus name. Amen. So I don't know where you are and I don't know if you are feeling as is. The actual first um, subtitle of this book was uh, saying goodbye to the as is life. And I want to kind of explain what as is and what I mean by that and what I mean by being stuck. Uh, I think of it this way as I describe in chapter five. As is is like a piece of furniture or um, you, you go to some clearance, uh, go to some really nice furniture store and the as is items have dings and dents and issues and they're marked down, right? So we, as uh, thrifty shoppers, might be really thrilled to find some as-is furniture and we could repurpose it or reuse it or put it into the corner and hide it. We have an as-is fridge that we got to save lots of money on when we moved into this house. But when it comes to our lives, we are not as-is. The struggles that we have today are not guaranteed to be struggles that we will have forever. Our character, our temperament, um, our personality, our spiritual giftings, our leadership bent, whoever we are, our sin issues are all under the authority of God. And when we move into a deep fellowship with Jesus and a deep relationship with the Lord through Jesus Christ, we have an opportunity to be changed and for our habits to change as our attitudes change. So the premise of Meet the New You is that Transformation happens when our thinking is influencing our living and when our thoughts are transformed by the truth. And so one of the things that I communicate in Meet the New You is the process of change 
being rooted in two biblical principles that I've nicknamed the trap and transform principles. So to trap is to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. And, and that comes from 2 Corinthians 10.5. And to be transformed comes from Romans 12.2. To be transformed by the renewing of our minds. And so the journey of transformation is really about what are we thinking and how is that influencing what we're living and how does that line up with what the scriptures have to say to us about who God is, who we are, and the wisdom of how to go about living our lives. So I am not seeing any um, questions popping up in here. So I just want to, if you don't mind for a second, I want to make sure. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. I'm going to have to jump back and forth, guys, and lean in. You're going to get a close look at my forehead here. Um, there, uh, I want to explain what you'll find in the book. And I want to answer a question, how long did it take to write the book? Okay, so first, what are you going to find in this book? Well, it's divided into five sections. And so you might be wondering if you're a math person, how do you do 21 divided by 5? So in the first four sections, there are five days of reading. And in the very last section, there's only one day. So it's a 21-day journey. And let me answer this question. Most people say, can you really change in 21 days? Well, no, you can't. In my opinion, you can't change in 21 days. You can start the process of transformation in 21 days. But I like to think of this as a 21 day of discovering the areas of your life that you need to focus on for real life change. So each of those five sections is divided um, according to the life coaching approach that I take. So life coaching uh, looks at awareness, where are you at? Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, assessment. Where, you know, how has God made you? Who are you? Uh, obstacles, what's standing in your way? Solutions, what are practical steps you can take forward? And then vision, where are you ultimately going? What is your end goal? And what is the direction of your life? So using those five phases, that's how the book is laid out. And then in each chapter, there's a concept, a story, and an application point, and the application exercises, the tra trap and transform part, where you get to not just read my memoir, because that's not what this book is about, you get to actually put into process the biblical principles through the type of questions I ask you. So I want to jump now that I've given you an overview of this book and what you'll find inside. I'm going to unpack some of the chapters as we go on. It's a Let me say this. It's a personal journey, but it is awesome to do with other people and in a group setting because the questions are designed to engage you and if you are involved in honest real relationships with other people you'll be able to use those questions for really healthy conversations accountability and prayer support so we do have a free leaders guide that you can find at the new you website um, and it's in the notes underneath the video that you're watching. So you just click that and download that. And then we've set up for you the types, the format, the structure. Do you want to do six weeks or 12 weeks? Uh, it doesn't matter what size, if you're doing it in a large group setting in church where you break into small groups or if you're just doing it one-on-one -on -one with somebody. That leader's guide will give you some structure of how to use this book with other people. Okay. So one question was, how long did it take to write the book? Well, 20 years and five months is the answer. Um, it is my life's work that I never intended to write. It, um, it's an overflow of the lessons that God has been teaching me. It's an overflow of what I learned through my life coaching training and working with clients. But from the time I signed the contract, which was September of 2014, the manuscript was turned in in February 2015. So I'm, I'm what they say is fast track for the publishing journey. Uh, we really wanted to be able to have this book out um, for this new year. And so I had to write fast. Um, okay, so here's a question from Brenda Rogers. Do you choose one area of your life to focus on or tackle several? I seem to have several. Well, Brenda, that's a great question. Um, I, I think one at a time is reasonable to focus on and in kind of priority order. So in the years that I was really dealing with my anger, I wasn't trying to develop a routine at home or figure out how to build margin space into my life or any of those other areas. I was just focusing on 
what's going on, why am I losing my temper like this, and what do I need to do to move forward? So to answer that question, I'd say just have grace with yourself and start with one area, probably the one that is nagging you the most or God's giving you the most insight about. And so you could be walking with him in that process of revelation. Okay, Katie asks, do you recommend the book for a group or study or is it best to tackle individually? So I would say both. Um, do the work yourself, but I think it's great to do it with a group. Um, this is a book that I wish I had, and I wish I had people to go through it with me um, because the encouragement, uh, I think, that comes from being with other people is just priceless. Um, okay, Amanda has a question. Uh, how do you balance your dreams and calling with other callings, as such as motherhood, being a wife? I find it difficult to balance all. Well, um, where do I want to start? I think balance is something that isn't a formulaic, honestly. I think we look at somebody else's life and think, I need to do it like them, and that would be my definition of balance. But I think balance is reflective of our God-given wiring and personality. So I'm somebody on the Highlands assessment, um, I'm a generalist and a specialist. So a generalist is somebody who likes to work with other people, have lots of plates in the air, and be um, highly engaged in activity. And so I fall to the high generalist, but I also have specialist in me. And specialist means there are certain things that I like to go deep on, that I like to research, that I like to focus on. So since if you compare me as a general specialist, you're going to look at my life and say, how on earth did she write a book, have four children, move a family, run a conference, run a ministry? How does she do all those things? Well, doing all those things is energy for me. It, it's life for me. If I only focused on one thing at a time, I would feel totally um, frustrated and overwhelmed. And so um, to, to answer that question, you've got to kind of figure out what type of person you are. And then from there, say what's within reason to focus on. So it's been very important to me to focus on uh, being full in, mentally in, as a mom and wife. So there were seasons in which I've had to lay things down that were part of what I would say is my dream or calling because it was getting in the way of me being fully mentally and emotionally engaged with caring for my kids at that age. And now at this stage in life, pretty much anything I say yes to is a family conversation uh, where we're sitting around the table and the older kids, well, my littles are now 10, get to weigh in on how they feel about that commitment so that it's an all buy-in or it's a say no um, out of respect for them and their needs. All right, we've got a winner. Uh, GK10917, you won the first book. Woo! Picture streamers and confetti going. I'm excited for you. So um, if there's more questions, keep firing them away. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next topic. And Amanda, I hope I answered that. I think I'm going to touch on that when we get into the last part of today's webcast talking about vision. Um, so uh, the big picture of your life is something that I talk about in the book. It's what we start off on. Life mapping is something that I've used personally and with my clients for years. And so life mapping is something that you do to zoom in on, I should say zoom in, on what God is doing after you zoom out to see what he's doing. We, like um, Brenda had asked, how do you know which problem to focus on first? That's why the book starts with this idea of taking the big picture and looking at it. And I have a great example. Um, I was just at the Philadelphia Art Museum with my husband recently, and we walked in the, the front door, and I did not notice this great big canvas that was hanging in the stairwell. So if you picture, huge two-story entryway. You walk in and there's this beautiful, beautiful backdrop. And I noticed the color had changed from the last time we were there, but I didn't take note of it as in, oh, was that replaced? I just, in my mind said, I think that's different. 
And so we went down and down the hallway, and as we came back the back hallway, I noticed that there was a little plaque of information, and I'm zooming in and reading, what is this about? And then I back up to look at the canvas, and I start to see things that I hadn't seen before. It was actually the backdrop for a, uh, a ballet company set back in the 1920s, if I remember the information correctly. And if I only looked at the square corner, down on the bottom left side of this campus, it would have just been yellow. But by backing up back to the entrance, looking at the whole canvas, I see details and elements of it that I wouldn't have seen if I was up close. And so when, as women especially, I think we focus in on the things that we're having problems with and issues with, and we need to kind of step back and get a big picture perspective. And I, I definitely think that this has to happen in prayer. I think stealing away and having quiet time with the Lord and asking him to speak to us and sitting there silently and then scribbling out what we hear him saying is one of the biggest, easiest ways to find out where we need to focus our time and energy on the transformation process. So oh, more questions. So. Jackie writes uh, to us and asks, would this be a book that I could do with unbelievers? I'm really loving the book so far. I've been taking it very slow so that I can journal and work on it each day. That's awesome. Uh, I think that I recommended to one person that they should take 21 weeks to do this book if they feel overwhelmed and that they can read a chapter a week and just really draw out the exercises and the, the focus on intention. And I have another friend who is doing the whole book in 21 days, but she's not going to answer the question. She's going to read the content to get the big picture and then go back in and focus really in a thoughtful way uh, through it. In terms of whether or not you can do it with unbelievers, I would say absolutely. Um, that's I wrote with them in mind. That's my heart. I did not grow up in a Christian home. I never met somebody who said that they loved Jesus or followed Jesus or lived for Jesus until I was in high school, late high school into college. And so I would really love um, to have this as the invitation for people who don't know Jesus yet to embrace him. And one of the things that I included in the book, let's see if I could find it on a quick flip through. Um, I share my testimony. I share how I came to know the Lord and the process of that. Uh, and then within phase one, which is the first five days, um, I can't find it. I don't want to take too much time, but there is a section. Oh, here it is. It's in, no, I didn't find it. Amy, maybe you could find it for me. Oh, there it is. Um, so page 40 to 41 in the trap and transform section, there is a, do you want to say yes to God? And it explains what it looks like to begin a relationship with the Lord. So that this makes it a really warm and inviting way to have that conversation. And if they're not ready yet, you just keep on moving through the content. Gail, hi Gail. I think it's, it's the Gail I know. Um, thanks for being here today. Thank you all for being here. So your question is, what inspired you to write and speak? Ha. Huh. <laughs> um, well, I would say it's the Lord's doing. I, I loved writing all through high school and in college. I had a friend who invited me to spend a semester abroad, which was a great opportunity for me to tell my parents to spend more money on my education. But no, um, I could not continue as a uh, major in elementary education and graduate from college in time uh, and go to that semester in London. So I changed my major to English. Uh, writing arts, and I promised my parents I'd go to get my master's in teaching. But to be honest, I never really wanted to teach because I was never passionate about a particular subject uh, to want to teach it. And I didn't really like being in front of people. Which, don't you find that a little bit ironic now? So I ended up um, just writing um, as an English major, but not not as a field. I never even really thought I'd ever write a book. I, I didn't know what I'd write about. But when the twins, who are now 10, were uh, six months old, I had a friend from college who was also an English major who uh, dared me to start a blog, basically. Um, Blogger had just come out, and at that point, I thought, well, if, if Kate can do it, I can do it. 
and I uh, started a blog and as a graphic designer I got into the graphic design process and so I um, started blogging and the Lord gave us babies who slept till like 10 in the morning so the girls would go off to school and I'd leave the kitchen a mess and deal with it when they were awake and I would um, sit and write and I started as what was coming together was devotional writing and a desire to really be able to um, share the truths of God that he was pouring into me through my time in scripture, my time in prayer, and then I wanted to share it with somebody. So I started blogging about it. And 10 years later, the, those blogs uh, evolved into um, my writing as a craft and and speaking opportunities. I my very first speaking opportunities were at a, what we called a beach chapel at the school I was at prior, where I was speaking with young girls and sharing my story with them and realizing that when I would get up to speak, I'd have like, you know, 20 pages of notes that I wrote in preparation and I'd speak for 45 minutes or an hour and I'd never look at my notes. And I'm the girl who can't remember uh, the lyrics to a song that she just sung you know, five seconds ago. So I knew that God had given it to me the ability to do it, uh, to be a speaker and to be a writer. And at this point, I'm just saying yes to him uh, as he opens doors. And I'm asking him for some, you know, confirmation and clarity on how and when and where. So another question is, am I working on a second book or would I like to? So uh, yes, I think so. Uh, I am working on a scripture prayer journal to go along with Meet the New You. And that really just feels like an extension of this book and a journey for myself. And I have a couple other book ideas in my brain. But I think um, I need to have a time of rest before I start that writing process again. So I don't know. We'll see what the Lord does. Um, Okay, here's a question. Oh, we've got a winner before I answer the next question. Brenda Rogers, you won a book. Woohoo! Um, thanks for being here. So uh, here's another question. What are your thoughts on the belief that we just need to move on? Well, I don't know. Um, the I do think we need to press on because Paul talks about that, to run the race with perseverance and to press on in our faith and in the journey of sanctification. You know, the, the scriptures tell us that he who began a good work in us will bring it to completion. So to me, the work is over the long haul and the pressing on in life is gonna happen over the long haul. But the idea that we're just supposed to move on and, and pretend like the past doesn't exist or not acknowledge it or get over it, I don't think is healthy, to be honest. I tried that for the first 20, 30 years of my life, and it didn't work. I thought that I could put God in a, you know, this mess in a compartment that God had authority over, but I didn't have to ever deal with again. But the problem is that there were beliefs uh, that were formed in those experiences that were still with me. So while on the outside, I might look like a new person, and I might be speaking as though I've changed the inside was still very much attached to what happened because I never reconciled it. And so I ended up um, going into counseling uh, to, and I talk about this in Meet the New You, as a way of saying what is happening and why is this happening? And what I discovered was that I really needed to go through the process of forgiveness um, and acknowledging my hurt before the Lord and having him transform my thinking to line up with his truth. So I don't think that going back to look at the past and to um, deal with it in counseling is the same as playing the victim mentality. I think it's what we do. We look back to grow forward. We look back to be freed from the past so that we can live healed and whole in the future. All right, let's see. Amy, go ahead and feed me more questions. Oh, I see one down here. Um, so, um, MT Moriah says, how did you know you wanted to be a life coach and an author? Having asked that is what I really want to know is what life events do you, led you to dream about that? So, I, I didn't have a dream to be an author, to be honest. I, I'm the type of person that 
you know, my husband and I could be out and having a conversation and I'll say something, he'll say something. And then we'll say, oh, I should write a book about that. But I also say, I don't want to clean house anymore. I think I'm going to be a Starbucks barista or I really want to open a flower shop. My, my desires are very whimsy and, and driven kind of by the emotion and by the feeling. So the desire to be an author wasn't something that um, was clear. However, there are friends in, the, in my past that would say to me, you always wanted to be an author. And it, I don't know if it's that or if that I saw people writing and speaking and having experience and there was something about what they were doing and the joy they seemed to have in doing it, that, that that's what I wanted, not the... Not that, oh, here, my name's on a cover or something. Um, and so there's that part. Being a life coach, this is a neat um, way God worked. I had the chance of being coached uh, in a position I had, I think, about 14 years ago. And that experience opened my eyes to the potential of life coaching and the, the blessing of being coached. And so when my oldest was um, about to enter seventh grade, I think that was the time frame, and my youngest were entering uh, kindergarten, and I had time on my hands, I actually explored becoming a counselor because I love to help people. And I often have people sitting on my couch or emailing me questions about how to solve problems emotionally, and so I thought I would do that. But I listened to my mom, she was very wise, and then she said, you will never be able to emotionally handle everybody's stuff as a counselor and then go home and care for your family. And, and she is right. And so what became appealing to me about coaching was that it's a, it's a helping industry like counseling, but from a different perspective. So a life coach is like an architect who comes along somebody who is in a healthy place and is moving forward and has the right support in their life if they're walking through something challenging, then they may also be coached. A counselor is more like an archeologist who's going in for the dig and dealing with the root issues and they've been trained to um, handle, uh, you know, they know the profiles of people going through stuff and they know how to respond to that appropriately. So what I love about the coach training process that I went through was one, it was affordable compared to other programs. It was uh, feasible in terms of time commitment for me at that stage in my life. It came from a biblical worldview, which was just amazing. And because of what I'd been through in my life and the counseling I'd been through, I understand the difference between counseling and coaching. And probably one of the greatest things I do is refer people to counseling. So that's, um, that's kind of how the life events led to me becoming a coach. And I, it is one of my most favorite things that I do. Every single coaching conversation I have, even just using the skills as a parent, has been a huge gift from the Lord. And I'm very grateful for that opportunity. Uh, so we got a bunch of questions here. Let me skim them here for a second and make sure I'm not missing anything. Okay, so Olivia asked, how would you suggest that someone build their prayer life? Do you think journals and devotionals are necessary for that? Uh, that's a great question. I think the way you build your prayer life is by praying. Uh, praying is communicating with God. It's having a conversation with him. And I think it's like our real life relationships. If I only talk to my friend every three weeks, I'm not really going to know what's going on in her life. She's not really going to know what's going on in mine. And that intimacy of our friendship is not going to be as strong as if we talk to each other on a regular basis. There will be pieces that are missing from our relationship. So I think that our relationship with God requires time that's focused and drowns out the noise of life. So I think we do need to not just pray on the go for a parking spot, or but we need to spend time with him alone uh, in conversation. And I think that the best way to learn how to pray, honestly, is looking at the scriptures. Uh, the psalmist paints a picture for us in prayer. Paul shows us how to pray. Jesus gives us instructions on how to pray. But I do think that part of the spiritual journey is um, requires the body of Christ to come around us and to show us how to actually implement those scriptures as prayer. So I think that devotionals and book on prayer can be very compelling, inspiring, 
and offer a structure that we need in our life that's used to structure. Okay. Um, in the book, is there a section or a chapter that kind of stands out above the others? Um, before I answer that question, I see we have winner number three. Gail, you want a book? I hope it blesses you. Um, so a chapter that stands out. No, honestly, like I, this book is the overflow of 20 years of life lessons. And so each one of those lessons is incredibly precious to me. So whether I'm talking about what happened to me in the Rose Garden when I um, ended up having to implement boundaries on my life and say no to things that were very important to me at the time, I mean, that, that story, that life experience, and how that could inspire other women to tend to their Rose Garden, uh, metaphorically speaking, is really precious. The chapter on forgiveness um, probably is one of the most uh, sacred or special chapters because that's about the miracle of the work that God did in my heart and in my relationship with my dad. And I, I'm my prayer is that that chapter is going to free women from the burden and the side effects of unforgiveness. Uh, so that chapter is really, really precious to me. Um, yeah, those, those two are probably the ones that stand out, the forgiveness and the boundaries. And, and then there were chapters that were just fun to write. So in terms of a light spiritedness to it, the chapter on personalities, when I talk about Abby, my daughter and my mom, uh, and the, the wiring that God has, has accomplished in us and continues to unfold in us are, I, I that chapter is just fun to me. So let's see. Uh, there more okay so one of the questions that um, people ask me back to this life coaching thing how does life coaching actually work and why would I bother paying for it um, well first off meet the new you is like having me as a personal life coach so it's it, it, it's a you know I don't know $14.99 dollar investment if you are tight on funds this is this will just help you. Um, but the process of life coaching uh, is rooted in this belief that we need to be seen and heard. And in our very fast paced world, our very transient world, being seen and being heard has dropped down on the totem pole. And what happens is we feel isolated, we feel alone, we feel unsure, we feel insecure. Because we need to be in fellowship with each other. And I think of it this way. God designed himself with Jesus and the Holy Spirit in the Trinity. as a, There's an example of relationship happening right in our Godhead. And then through Jesus and the Holy Spirit working in us, he's brought us together into relationship with him. And then in, in the scriptures, it talks about us in relationship to each other in the body of Christ and the parts we play. We need each other. I really honestly believe that we're better together than isolated. And so what happens is uh, life coaching, I honestly think, is a result of a lack of really healthy relationships and a lack of the ability to listen well. So one of the last chapters in the book is on mentoring and the art of listening and how to become a better listener because that's going to create more effective and meaningful relationships with other people. And so I life coaching is something in which you make a short-term commitment and a short-term investment to be heard and encouraged on a particular area of life in which you feel stuck or you need accountability in. And the as a life coach, I am not telling you what to do. I'm not telling you how to solve a problem. I'm not even telling you my side of the story or my comparable example. I'm just listening to you and I'm asking questions that drive you to the aha moment. And as I'm asking those questions, I am praying for you and I'm asking the Lord to speak to you and to reveal to you the solutions that you need to embrace. And so you could go through a four session or a six session or a 10 session commitment and walk away with some key ahas that you can put into place for the rest of your life that finding a friend who can sit down and really walk through that process with you may be a whole lot more challenging. 
And that friend, if they don't have the life coaching training and they're not a, an effective listener, isn't going to necessarily drive you to the Lord for the solution, but they may be telling you, and you all know, when somebody tells you what to do, it's not as effective as if you own it and realize that this is the, the steps that you have to take moving forward. Okay, so um, let's see. We got more questions here. Uh, question is, do you think we should have a mentor in life? Yes, I do. But I think that how we define mentor is really important. I don't, I don't think that the average person is going to have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody who they meet with on a regular basis who is all about pouring into their life. But I think in the body of Christ that God brings into our life people who speak life into us and we need to come under them in a very teachable, humble way. So let me give you an example. I was at Bible study this morning, and I, I love it. The group that I'm in, I, I'm probably middle of the pack in terms of age, and I love that diversity within the body of Christ. And so um, we were talking about um, living in the light as opposed to living in the darkness, and one woman asked a question about uh, media and t watching TV and you know, what type of shows should you or shouldn't you want? And that could become a very legalistic conversation. So this other woman in the group uh, drove us to scripture and she said, well, you know, we need to look at whatever is noble, pure, right, true, and use that scripture passage to kind of discern whether or not we should move, be moving forward with this uh, activity. So I pitched a question back her way and I said, what do you do when you're raising teenagers and you're trying to live by the whatever principle and yet you don't want to exasperate them either but you want to teach them and affect boundaries and so she answered the question and part of the reason i answer, asked that question is because i recognize that she's 20 years older than me and has some wisdom on this and that there were other women in the group that were 10 years younger than me with small children that needed to hear her wisdom so in essence, I was giving her the mentoring baton to carry for my benefit and for the benefit of the other people in this group. And at the end of group, she comes over to me and she just really encouraged me uh, in very practical ways. And so I, I then make a mental checklist of like, God, thank you for that mentoring moment. And so in terms of finding a mentor, there's definitely a chapter in here about how to cultivate mentoring relationships both ways, me down and those to me, but also to be defining them in a way that is, I think, non-traditional, to look for the, the opportunities for the older generation to speak into us and to receive that, and for us as the older generation to look for opportunities to speak into the next generation by doing life side by side with them, kind of like the Deuteronomy 6 passage where you know, when you're walking on the road and when you're sitting down and standing up, you're, everything's pointing to the glory of God and you're intentional about that. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, choose uh, Sarah's question here. My heart is for moms with young kiddos, especially those who are struggling. Is there a specific way you can see this book ministering to their hearts? Oh, yeah, 100%. Um, there are a lot of examples that I throw into this book that my hope is it is for young moms. Uh, just for them to be able to, in the chaos of diaper duty and nap time and craziness, first off, the chapters are so short. And, and so if they only have five minutes at a time, they could read a chapter in five minutes and then another five minutes later answer one question and they could just do as much as they're able to. Uh, but it's it's going to hopefully give them a big picture of their life, like the life mapping exercises, the story timeline, the um, what is God doing in their hearts and what is he wanting to accomplish them and the priority piece uh, and the, the comparison trap, the comparison trap chapter, I think will be a huge blessing to a mom with young kiddos. Okay. Um, uh, A-M-A-N-Y-K -A says, how does this book compare with life coaching sessions with you? Um, well, you won't hear my voice, which is 
I don't know, maybe a, a bonus, maybe not, but um, a life coaching session with me, I'm going to be able to ask you questions based on what you just answered. And so it's going to drive to the um, heart of the issue faster if you were being coached. The book, however, uses the type of life coaching questions that will force you to answer it rather than to just be an open-ended question. Um, so that, I say that would be the difference uh, between a real life coaching uh, experience as opposed to what you get out of, out of doing the book. Um, let's see. Okay, we got a bunch of questions about um, coaching and t working with teens because I have this ministry, More to Be, uh, which is all about, it started as an overflow of what I was doing in real life, working with teens, and then and providing resources for working with teens, and then <laughs> equipping moms and mentors to work with teens. And now More to Be is really about encouraging every woman to embrace transformation uh, for the sake of impacting the next generation. But if you poke around at moretobe.com, you'll discover that there's a lot of resources um, for teens and teen Bible studies. So I think that's where some of these, I'm kind of like the teen person. Um, and so one question is, what's the difference between coaching and discipleship, uh, and especially when you're working with the teen from church? So a discipleship, I define this way. It's teaching scripture. If you're discipling somebody biblically, you're teaching them scripture. If you're mentoring biblically, you're doing life side by side in a biblical way. If you're coaching somebody, you're not telling them what to do, but you're asking them questions so that they arrive at their um, at the, at the solution. Now, obviously, if you're asking questions from a biblical worldview, hopefully those answers are going to arrive at a biblical worldview. But that's not always um, that's not always the case if that person isn't in that place wanting to receive the truths of Scripture. So. Uh, question is, do you think the book would be useful for early teens or do you think it'd be better off with somebody specifically tailored, uh, with something specifically tailored for their age, like 12 to 14? Um, I would say, so I I know a group of, of uh, 16, 17, 18 year old girls who are doing this book right now. Um, I'm, I'm eager to see what their uh, response will be to it. To me, if I was 16, Give me this book. I want to learn these things now as opposed to later. However, my examples in the book are driven for an adult woman. So somebody who's um, college age and older beginning to look at how, you know, at their life from the position of relationships and work, marriage or singlehood, motherhood, um, ministry from that perspective. So if they, if it's a mature teen who can get through the get around the examples, I think it would be great. And if it's something that they're doing with you as a leader, I think that's an opportunity for you to say, okay, Lisa says this in the book, but let's put it in teen terms. What's that experience like for you with this issue? Does that make sense? Okay, so, um, okay, we got a good question here. Oh, we've got another winner. So Jackie is winner number four. And Amy's still typing, so um, I'm going to look at another question. Uh, Gail is asking another question. I see women comparing themselves to others. Is this a good book to help them with? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, I still struggle with that. I'm just being very honest. Insecurity and in comparison is my biggest, biggest obstacle uh, currently, and I am still working through that. And I don't know if that's going to be a lifelong work through issue or if that... Um, because it keeps me humble before the Lord, or if it's something that he's just going to break me free of. But there is a chapter on comparison, um, which I share a really, really cool story of uh, how I really struggle with comparison. And um, my friend um, spoke some truth into my life at that time. And I want to, I'm just going to give you that part, even though it's in the book right now. My, my, one of my dearest friends said to me, God is going to do in you what God is going to do in you. And it's not going to look like what he does in anyone else. And whoever, I wish I could see you. I want to jump through the screen right now and look at whoever is in a place right now of feeling like, Lord, I want what they have. I, I, mine is not good enough. Or if only it could look like that. 
Well, you know what? We're only seeing half of a story, the one that is visible. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes. We don't know what's happened to get that person to that place. We don't know what junk they're balancing in the middle of what looks really shiny and, and bling bling. And so I think we need to continually put ourselves in a position of, Lord, forgive me for my compar comparing. Forgive me for my jealousy. Because the root of comparison is jealousy. And, and what, why is that jealousy there? Is it a devaluing of the life that God has given you? And so I think not only is there this chapter on comparison, but the, everything leading up to that chapter on comparison about the way God has made you, how he's put together your life, your wiring, your, your gifting, your abilities, your relationships and responsibilities. You're going to see the whole package of how God has made you. And I think my hope and prayer is that you will walk away really from a place of gratitude of saying, God, thank you. And that as more of that gratitude happens, less of the comparison will happen. Okay, so um, let's see. We got more, a little bit more time here. So uh, one of the questions is, I have passed much like yours, getting to the root of the issues and dealing with it seems so painful. I'm not sure what to do with that. Do you think it can be skipped? Uh, <laughs> no, I don't think dealing with our root issues can be skipped, even if they are painful. Um, there was a book that I read years ago that talked about in grief, walking through the darkness of the night and coming out in the morning light. And even if walking into that darkness is terrifying, God's mercies are new every morning. And on the other side of that darkness, if we pursue God and pursue his light, which is truth, which is Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and, and the life that we long for, we will be healed through that process. Now, I, I give some boundaries on this. Um, one of the things that I would say is that when you're going through dealing with the root issues, do it with somebody who is capable and qualified to walk through it with you. So if you're struggling with an present or past, addiction, abuse, um, an eating disorder, depression, um, relationship dysfunctions, um, traumas like living through, you know, a parent's divorce or your own divorce, a death of a loved one or suicide uh, situations, a anything that is like the biggies of life that really hit us hard, I think sometimes in God's mercy that we don't actually deal with it at the time, but I think at some point it needs to be dealt with. And to deal with that, I would highly recommend a counselor who has a biblical worldview. And so I'm not saying that it has to be a practice that's a Christian counseling practice, but that that person that you're working with is a believer and believes in the power of prayer and believes and sees themselves as somebody who is co-laboring with God, is being used by God to speak life into your life, life to help you deal with those root issues. Because I really do believe that healing is a, is a possibility. I really do. And I think that God accomplishes that in a myriad of ways. And that we, we need to be cautious not to put him in a box and say, this is the only way God deals with problems. I think we need to be willing to say, God can deal with us personally. God can deal with us corporately in the body of Christ. And God can deal with us in a professional capacity too uh, in order to get that healing we need to move forward. And the root issues, uh, when, I, when I think about root issues, and I talk about this in the book, the illustration of a dandelion. So I should have had my dandelion stick with me here. But when, when you want to get a dandelion weed, out of the ground, you cannot just pull it up. You can't just chop it off. You have to get down to the root issues and remove that dandelion or it's going to grow back again and again. And I think it's the same way with our issues. If we don't deal with the root of what's causing it, uh, it's just going to come back and manifest in other ways. Okay. Um, so 
Um, let's see, we've got one question. How could a person in need of counseling find one? Uh, my, my best recommendation, this is how I went about it when I was looking for a counselor, uh, ask people. Um, and so that's something I've done and being new to the area. I'm asking people who are they using. I'm compiling a list. But I highly recommend Focus on the Family has a pretty great search engine uh, and resource where they have like approved of counselors in your particular area. And I would start with them and I would call a number of them uh, to figure out the best fit, the cost. Do they offer a sliding scale? Is this covered under insurance? So those are some of the questions that you would want um, to have answered and start there. So uh, we got one more question and then I might need to start wrapping up and looking at the time here. How do you stay focused on the task ahead of you? Ah, it's over there. <laughs> I, have, um, I have two ways that I do it. I have a Google Calendar. I have three ways I do it. I have a Google Calendar to stay, um, I'm trying to stay on schedule. I use Evernote to keep all my lists uh, and ideas there and I check that periodically. But I have something that I created called the Restart Planner. And that planner, it's available at alisapulliam.com. Um, it's a PDF download, it's worksheets, and I have a, like a half sheet that I keep on a clipboard. And so every day I have my time with the Lord, Lord willing, first thing after the kids get off to school. And then I jot down my schedule for the day and what I need to take care of. And I try to focus on three main things. So I, I put down on the bottom of the list, one, two, and three, and that's like, I have to do those things today because my list is always longer than what I have time for. So um, I'll make my list long, but I'll have my three that I need to stay focused on. And one of the ways that I stay focused from like a spiritual perspective is I'm continually asking God to show me the big picture and seeking his counsel and the accountability of my husband and I've got two or three key friends that if I get a big idea, because I'm like the big idea girl, uh, I go to them with my big ideas before I move forward. And even with like the more to be team of contributors that I have, I'll pitch ideas out to them before I move ahead on a project on that website and ministry. So I think accountability is one way that we can uh, stay focused. And I think that being intentional and realizing what are our priorities, who, and when I say priorities, who are the people that God has put in your life that you're irreplaceable for? So for me, my husband doesn't have another wife and my children don't have another mother. So their priorities one and two because I'm irreplaceable to them as long as I'm still living. <laughs> um, and then I kind of go beyond there and I think, okay, well, where else is my time? What have I already said yes to that I need to follow through on before saying yes to something else? And what is wise stewardship of our finances, which a if you notice, there's no book on finances, no chapter on finances in this book because that, I mean, that's an area of struggle for so many of us. And I certainly don't feel like I have, um, I'm still learning on that, how to be a good steward of our finances. So um, we've got another winner, Amanda Martinson. Congratulations on getting that book. And let's see. Um, so I want to wrap up with uh, this question. How are you dealing with present day obstacles? And this actually isn't in the book. Somebody asked if I was going to write another book. It might make it in the next book. Um, one of my present day obstacles is insecurity. And you know, there's so many books out on insecurity. And we know the truth. Like our worth is found in Christ alone. So why are we questioning and doubting and wondering, you know, about our worth and comparing ourselves to others. So in, in the process of writing Meet the New You, uh, the Lord gave me a series of words that have become so precious to me. Actually, I have it, I have it on my phone case. And, and he, he, he spoke these words to me as I penned them out. And when I was reading through the galleys and proofing at that stage, God was really driving it home against me. He said, Lisa, you are chosen, holy, dearly loved, called, qualified, accepted, and one of a kind. And so here he's given us our identity. He's given us who we are. All of those words come from 
biblical principles that I've taken into my brain and my heart over the years, but has not yet become so um, ingrained in me that it's my knee-jerk reaction. I'm still as much in progress as any of us are. So yesterday morning, I was really um, just going to the Lord on this again and saying, like, enough is enough already. Lord, I just, I don't want to deal with the insecurity piece anymore. I want to be overflowing with your joy and your confidence and your perspective and not be thinking about all these other tapes that play in my head. And he gave me a visual as I was spending this time in prayer. And I had just been doing this Bible study in 1 John and been reflecting on what does it mean to be in fellowship with Christ? What does it mean to be in fellowship with God in this tight, connected relationship with him? And so as I was spending this time in prayer and writing it out in my journal, actually, I think the wrong bar. Yeah, it's over there. Um, one of the thoughts that came to my mind was this visual of this pole. I had been talking with somebody the night before about this. And I just feel like I'm this woman who's just walking along and then smack, boom, I, I hit the pole of insecurity. And my identity, I just fall in a slump on the ground. I've got this big bruise on my head and I'm just this mess. And as I get up from this, what's my reaction? God, why won't you move that pole? In other words, this insecurity piece, why won't you deal with it, Lord? I have asked you again and again, please change me. Please deal with this. Why am I facing this obstacle again and again? And so I did what I encourage you to do and meet the new you. Ask God about it. So I was asking him, why do I do this? What, what am I missing? And he said, well, what, why do you keep walking in the pole when you could walk around it? I'm right here. Here's my hand. Step to me and shift your focus on the pole, the outcome, and the potential of hitting it in the future and choose a different way. And I sat there and I thought, you're kidding me. Like, it's that, Lord, I just need to not walk into the pole again. But what happens if I do walk into the pole again, right? And so the, the deal is, it's going to be there. It's going to be a problem that I struggle with. It's part of my flesh response to things. But the sweetness that I feel like I can focus on right now in terms of this obstacle is that Christ is right there. The fellowship that I can have with God, my decision to put my 100% focus on the Lord is, is there waiting for me if I would say yes to it. And it's not just saying, yes, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. And you now have made a way for me to be with you in heaven eternally. And you have filled me with the Holy Spirit so I can hear your voice and understand your word. It's not just that gain. It's the everyday relationship that we get to have with our Redeemer, our friend, our Savior, our God, our Creator. And so I feel like, literally, I feel like my head's been just like kind of turned. And I don't know how it's going to play out. I'm sure I'm going to have plenty of opportunities. But, but this idea of being chosen, holy, and dearly loved is just reverberating in my ears. And, and the power uh, that God gives us to choose him when he, because he loves us and wants to be in relationship with us is, is, is just amazing. And that transformation comes from time in the word. And so I would say, as much as I want you to buy this book and give it to everyone you know and enable this message to get out to women and even teen girls who are struggling, my biggest prayer, my biggest desire is for you to fellowship with God and have a fresh encounter with Him through a relationship that's deeply connected and, and with Jesus Christ. And from that overflow, pick this up and, and dig into the scriptures and discover what it is that God has for you in your life. You know, John tells us that when we have fellowship with God, that he has put us in relationship with him and that joy that we crave is in that relationship. So I just hope and pray that uh, this fresh lesson that I'm getting from the Lord would bless you too. So I think 
we need to wrap up. So let me say this. You can get this book wherever books are sold. Um, bookstores like Barnes and Noble and Family uh, Christian are great places to go. They do have the book in stock. You can also find it on Amazon and Waterbrook Press's site. Um, I really, if you, I think if you're watching this, uh, you're at the elisapoliumcom slash webcast page. And in that page, you'll see a bunch of links to resources that, that are available for the book and information about my coaching services and all sorts of goodies. So I just look forward to connecting to connecting with you in real life. You can drop me a message. And if there are any questions that didn't get answered today, I am going to follow up with um, those questions being answered in the form of blog post in the future. Thank you again for spending this time with me. And if you're listening to this later on, I just really hope and pray that this encourages you and look forward to hearing your feedback when you get a chance. Thanks again. Bye.